Hello, hello, it's the Extra Rewind Show podcast. On today's episode, I speak to a lady that's one half of one of the greatest 80s pop duos of all time. They sold 10 million records and had 14 singles on the UK charts alone. The wonderful Teresa Bazaar. Check it out. Here we go. Hey, I'm Jack Hughes from Wang Chung. Hey, everybody, this is Ivan from Men Without Hats. Hello, everybody, this is Francis Dunry from It Bites. Hi, everyone, this is Andy from Modern Romance. Hi, everyone, this is Charlene. Hi. This is Betty Seaton from Music E. Hi, I'm Nick Haywood. Hi, this is Kevin from Fiction Factory. And you're listening to the 80s Rewind Show podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. It's time, it's time. to bring you yet another amazing episode. And now, and now. welcome your host, Rob, the face for Radio Burgess. Enjoy the show. On this fantastic edition of the 80s Rewind Show podcast, I speak to the wonderful Teresa Bazaar. She told me about accidentally joining the band Guys and Dolls, a fantastic time with Dollar and David Van Day, and her solo album The Big Kiss and all the amazing producers she worked with. She's a lovely lady. It's a great episode. I hope you enjoy it. And don't forget to like and subscribe and tell your friends about the show. Just click the like and subscribe button below. I'll see you on the next one. Enjoy. If we can go back a bit, if that's all right. Well, yeah. you, you said your mum's, is it 96? My mother's 96 hopefully 97 in July, which is quite extraordinary, really. That's wonderful. And uh, was she into music? Um, was, was, it, was it a musical household growing up? No, not at all. Uh, so my, my father, um, my late dad, he was a semi-professional jazz guitarist. Wow. So I did have music sort of in the house a little bit. And um, when I was young, I would listen, you know, he would be listening to Joe Pass, Django Reinhardt, um Brubeck five you know Dave Brubeck um that kind of thing so uh, um and then Frank and Ella so Frank and Ella were like the you know and, and then we go to more of the avant-garde so um yeah so always heard music and he'd be packed and he he played he was a semi-professional jazz guitarist in a small little band that just did some local gigs that's fantastic. And was your influences musically from your dad? Was it jazz you was into? Was you into pop? Was you into rock? I was uh, a ballet girl. Oh, really? I was, into, I was into classical music. I fell in love with ballet at the age of two and a half because I was taken to um, a ballet studio with my older sister and I refused to leave. And I was actually a very compliant little girl. I was very polite. But I saw this. I thought, I'm not going anywhere. And the teacher was so nice. <laughs> And I was so being so stubborn and my mother was like having a bit of a, you know, worry about what was I going to do. And um, the teacher came home and said, well, if she stands at the back and doesn't make a sound, she can stay. So I was allowed to stand at the back and mimic what they were doing. So from the age of two and a half, I started ballet and I went, I was allowed to go every week. Wow. Every week and stand at the back. And uh, I think that they had a pianist and obviously they play some sort of classical music and from a very young age I fell in love so with all the the real classicists and I've since I'm, I'm a mad um, classical fan of music but um, uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, Chopin, um, you know the ballet pieces but um, Beethoven, I mean you name it and I'm I listen to I listen to classic FM I speak to Bill Overton who's a fave of mine. He does the night shift, so it's my day. And I, and I send him messages, on uh, tweets on Twitter. And um, I, I, my whole horizons, of, I mean, I've got like a rainbow. I mean, the amount of music I listen to is just extraordinary. And it kind of balances out all the pop. Mm. And you understand there's still only eight notes in an octave. Uh, and how extraordinary that you've got these incredible melodies so i mean you know it doesn't matter what jazz rock you know whatever it's um so i fell in love with music probably the same day as i fell in love with ballet really about two and a half and um my first records were classical records um chopin nocturnes tchaikovsky i think it was um swan lake um then it was um dvorak the new world symphony uh, and I saved up my pocket money when I was old enough, or my mum and dad would buy it for a pres birthday present. And um, they and I used to listen to them all the time. I mean, but I knew every melody, 
off by heart. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, it's funny if you mentioned that during the 80s, they did that. I don't know if you remember, there was a classic series that came out with a record and a magazine. And I actually, I've still got all those. I bought them at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Holst Planets was my favorite. I think that's the one. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Jupiter's that. pretty fantastic. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's just so moody and oh, it just moves in such a beautiful <laughs> way. It's great. <laughs> so, um, you joined a band called Guys and Dolls at 17, is that right? You went along for an audition and joined that. Yeah, I thought I was going for um, a sort of a musical sort of like group that was touring. I had no idea it was a pop group exactly. So I was um, completely out of my depth. I My audition was, uh, my song was somewhere from West Side Story, really contemporary. Mm. And you had to say something. So I chose a piece of Shakespeare. And I wore a long black skirt and a black polo neck jumper and I had like long sort of like dark Julie Felix hair, probably no makeup and just that was me. Yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. I was watching it on YouTube the other day. Uh, there's a whole lot of loving. That was the first single, wasn't it? Is that right? Yeah. And uh, it was all medallions and open shirts and hairspray. It was wonderful oh to watch. And I was just, I was a bit, I mean, I wasn't the youngest. Uh, Julie Forsyth was the youngest, and then David Van Day was the next youngest. But I was the most naive because they all went to Italia Conti, you know, the mm. premier showbiz musical theatre school. So they'd all had experience with um, TV and performing. And I'd had some experience, you know, with tiny bits of performing, but they were so streetwise. And I was just like, a baby i'm mean, seriously uh yeah i had no idea and i probably thought putty in our hands she is you know yeah it's either that or i was the short i mean you know this is in the book i was the shortest person that they could find to match up with david because they wanted to have the three girls and the three boys but that's not a jibe but i mean it's true you know yeah. <laughs> not a tall guy, so we look we were the cute ones i mean you know you've got to have your image together that's all right. Was it a touring band? Did it tour much? Guys and Dolls? Yeah. Oh, about 48 weeks of the year. Oh, really? So, so, we so never, got... ever stopped working. We, we were a cab. So we were the, that was the cabaret circuit. Everyone, and in those days, so it was 74 to 78, that was my stint. That was how people went out. And, and, and I think that's a really nice way to have a night out. You go, and you have a meal, might not be the greatest food, but you're going to get a show and a meal and have a glass of wine or two. And it's all like, I quite like that. It's a bit like Vegas. You know, so Batley's Variety Club, that was one of the biggest in the land. You know, you get big artists coming here from the States. Uh, mm. Here, that's why I think I'm here. You know, <laughs> but big artists, you know, um, huge big acts playing because that's how people like to go out. You work hard, you save your money, you want to have a night out, you want to go and be looked after. And having your table in that cabaret style, it's quite a nice way of entertainment, I think. Yeah. Was it like a lineup? Were you part of a lineup or did you get like a. No, show? no, we had our own shows. I mean, it's a big deal. You know, and we worked every day of the week. And we were, we had a a, a van that had converted sort of airplane sort of seats that went back a little bit. And we would literally be like, we'd be flying somewhere, we'd be on the road. It was so hard. I mean, you know, yeah. you think it's glamorous, we would pay diddly squat, you know, and it was really hard. Was it great training? Before, great training, yeah, I learned a lot. And actually the most thing I learned was about a, be nice to everybody because you never know who you're going to meet on the way down. So I was always very nice to receptionists and everyone, you know, I'd always be very polite. That's my upbringing anyway. But I learned, I so, somehow fell in love with pop music. I mean, you know, crazy, crazy. And yeah. started really analysing, you know, and so I thought, wow, you know, from the carpenters to listening to everything and and. That was my um, training in harmonies, you know, with guys and dolls. You've got three, six voices. How do you put that together to make a good sounding record? 
and everyone finds their slot and I had the highest voice and the lightest voice so I was always on the top so but I understood about harmonies and that's I think that's just been a probably from my dad or from listening to the Carpenters you know which was was the first pop record I ever listened to I kind of understood where I fitted in Mm. and and that those are those that's your training you're completely right Robbie that's the training yeah I love that your journey was backwards. Pop came after. <laughs> I, think that's I had no idea about, uh, as I said, I went into that audition. I thought, I don't like pop music. What are they talking about? A pop band. You know, it's nothing like my intentions. But I had the old adage because I used to love watching um, musicals. And, mm. and the whole thing I, I must have heard somewhere, you know, you have to say you can do everything. So you, if you can't ride a horse, if you go for an audition, say, oh, of course I can ride a horse. Or, you know, what do you like? Oh, yeah, do you like pop music? Oh, I love pop music. I'm going, I don't know anything about pop music. So I just said yes to everything because that's the, that was the Hollywood era. Yeah. You know, just say yes and then work it out afterwards if you get the job. So, <laughs> um, so that's what I did. And I went and... um it, it's been written, but you'll. We went to that first meeting when we were all introduced, guys and dolls. And I was most definitely the odd one out. Oh, really? I was like, well, why was I there? <laughs> Little Miss Mouse who sat in the corner, I just watched them so loud and so confident. And there's me being super quiet and respectful and just, oh, you know. And then they asked us to sign the contracts, and there's me going, I don't think we should be doing that because you need to get some legal advice. I mean, that's, you know, I had all, I had a different upbringing completely, yeah. you know, and Dominic and Paul, they were 10 years older than me. I mean, they had a lot of experience in the music industry. I had nothing. <laughs> you had street smarts. That's what you had. <laughs> I don't even, I, I think I just, you know, I don't think I did, Robbie. I think I had, um, an innate belief in myself, which I've kind of, lost it for a while through the decades you know uh but i think i just believe that if you are incredibly honest and open your sincerity will shine through mm. eventually you know with and especially i mean that is ridiculous as a statement isn't it no in no. this social media world when everyone is faking everyone with influences and everything that would be the most ridiculously naive statement you could make. Yet here I am, an almost 68-year-old going, I still believe that. I think it will cut through if you say it in the right uh, – that's what I believe. I mean, I think I'm mad, probably. <laughs> <laughs> the best kind of mad, though. Um, <laughs> so we get to 77, and you and David are sort of – did you just have enough, or was it just you wanted to go off and do a new career? Was the touring getting to you? Was there too much work? Oh, uh, no, we got kicked out. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They got, we got kicked out because I kept making waves about the quality of the records and, and the songs and our musical direction fundamentally, and David wasn't getting enough camera shots, and um, he just wanted to be – the Davy Jones and and um, David Cassidy that he always knew he could be, and mm. um, so we got kicked out because we just made too many waves. Right, and then so was when you got kicked out. Did you and David instantly know you wanted to work together? Was it sort of what do we do now kind of scenario, or was it? No, he wanted to be a solo artist, and I pretended to be a secretary. Um, and I would try and phone record companies and get him a an interview or something, and I couldn't. And I, um, ironically, I got offered um, a solo deal uh, with um, EMI Holland for myself. And I went, I just rejected it. I mean, I said, well, no, 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 you've got the wrong person. It's him. He, he's the one, you know, and I'm just, I'm happy to be supporting him, you know, so in love with him. And uh, no, so um, it just happened that we met up with some people who said, oh, I think maybe if you were a duo, that would be good. There's no UK duo. You mm. know, there's Donnie Marie and there's uh, Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta with Greece, but there's no UK. How about that? And um, I think it was sort of desperation stakes then, and David maybe said, well, give it a whirl and see. And uh, we were offered a, a contract about, I don't know, a 
few weeks later. It didn't take very long. Wow. And it was, was it a French label that offered you? A uh, so it was um, a, a UK label called Acrobat Records. And um, they ended up getting uh, a deal with Career, the French label, um, for distribution. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's how it worked. But, uh, and the guy was called Chris Yule, who was a fabulous MD from, I think he was at CBS, was it EMI? Can't quite remember now. But um, very great ears. I mean, one of the best pairs of ears I've ever and, and how quickly did you get working on the first album? Was it, was it, like uh, a little, or did you get straight stuck into it? Straight stuck into it. And we were meant to work with uh, David Courtney because he wrote the first two tracks, Shooting Star and Who You With in the Moonlight. But um, he was busy uh, working with somebody else. So um, Chris Yule had signed Chris Neal as a producer and said, Well, you can't work with David Courtney, so you'll have to work with him. And, and we just said, well, okay. And, of course, how amazing was that? How fortuitous that you get to work with one of the best producers globally, I mean, ever. Chris Neal is a, is a legend. I mean, it's just brilliant. What I love about the album is um, I, I have not heard it in a while, so I listened to it fresh again, and it's like an ELO space concept album. And that's, that's what I loved about it. it was, it's like, this is not the dollar I know, but this is the dollar I really like. It was, it was mm. like... I just loved, I mean, Star Control, I think is fantastic. I think it's an amazing track. I'm so happy you say that, you know. So what I did about three nights ago, not that you're into my personal life too much, but okay. I went to bed about half past nine, um, other circumstances at play, and I thought, okay, I'm going to be in my room. I'm going to listen to the whole of the first album, the Shooting Stars album, so I haven't listened to it in a long time all the way through and I listened to it and um, yeah of course you get to the end of it and, and I've had a few messages from some people on my team going you've got to perform that live you've got to perform that live and why was it and, and really what happened was that's towards the end of the recording of the album and whether it was the budget getting tight or time wise and Things weren't working so well. And I remember writing that because it was really an homage to the Carpenters. Mm. Inter yeah. You know, calling occupants from independent, which I, I you know, I love that music so much. And it was really meant to be a respectful nod to, to them. Yeah. And I'd yeah. had this idea about how it would work, but we'd had this sort of structure that david would sing the lead vocals and i'd be doing all the layering and the, the creating the sound i mean which is just as important but well you could have a long chat about that but <laughs> but um it wasn't working I, I, and i think we were under the pump basically and so chris came back in and he said look i've got an idea and he pulled this vocoder out with this person so they said how about we do it like this? And I think I thought that it was going to start like that, but kind of transition into a vocal, mm. like a carpenter's beautiful lush, and it didn't. Mm. And he ended up doing the whole thing. And to be very honest, you know, I was heartbroken because I thought the melody was, it was just such a, a yearning kind of gentle, sad kind of melody that I don't think, I love the backing track and everything, but I don't think the vocoder really gave the track exactly what it needed. That's my, uh, what did you think? What do you think? I think I love a vocoder. I think it's, it's that dimensional sound that you can't get from a human. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. And what was interesting was, um, the Carpenters covered International by a band called Clatu. I don't know if you know this. No. Um, so it was a cover from a band called Clatu. I'm going to quickly dive into the history because it's quite interesting. So in I think it's 1978, there's a white vinyl floating around um, and it was got sent out to record companies and DJs. Everyone was picking it up and playing it, thinking it was the next Beatles album because it's very similar to the Beatles. And it turns out it was a Canadian band called Clatu. Um, and the Carpenters, somewhere along the line, heard the single 
into planetary craft and covered it. Now, what's interesting is Star Control sounds a lot like the Klaatu album. It's really strange. So, really? But you, you like the Vokoda, but do you, do you, so I, I guess, thought it might morph, it would kind of open out into a different kind of, you know, but, um, but I love the melody and, and, and the ending for me, I remember exactly the synthesizers and, and the very last one, it's like someone saying bye-bye, going off to Pluto somewhere. It's just, it's just so gentle and it's very, it, it's mesmerizing. And years later with my two kids, love star wars you know so every time you know i just like that kind of stuff i'm not a sci-fi person but yeah. um yeah it was um it was it was a lovely track and i'm not sure you know that treatment was ideal but uh you know you've got other things at stake yeah it's lovely and on that obviously you had um you had uh, Love's Got Hold On Me as well, which was your first self-written one. Is that right? So can we talk about the writing of yeah. that? Was that easy to write? Was it a quick song to, to do? Um, so we were in our flat and I uh, had my grand upright piano sort of stuck in the bedroom there, really. And uh, it was inspired by um, the Bee Gees, How Deep Is Your Love? Mm. Because I love the Bee Gees. Again, it's harmonies. You know, I'm going... How do they do that? How do they create that sound? It's not just that, it's a sound. And I thought it sounded so airy, which I guess resonated with me. And I thought, try and do something that suits you. <laughs> I'm not trying to do something that is the opposite, um, which is what we all like to do. You've got red hair, make it brown, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I think that the, the melody came quite easily. And um it was obviously I was writing it for David because that's that was the you know if you've got a hit record and with the guys and dolls experience don't don't upset the apple cart just stick to the formula yeah um and uh yeah I I kind of I I liked it was a very natural easy song to write and and it and it was uh ideas of you know summer breezes you know that lovely sort of freshness and uh, we went into the studio and he couldn't sing it it was wow. a it was a nightmare really and um i remember chris neil looking at me because i was in the control room and dave was in the studio and he said but you wrote this right i said yeah and he said it's in his key and i said yes <laughs> and he said and he looked at me i said just shrugged i mean i thought because you know that's david david's you know he could if he got something he'd be okay if it didn't fit instantly with him you, he couldn't learn it hmm. you know he just it just was he just was it had to be a natural instinctive thing and um so that's when chris said well you go and have a go and I remember, I'm a, I'm a very polite, I would say, oh, no, no, no. I said, it's not in my key, and, and that's not what we're meant to do. And he looked at me and said, just go and have a try. And I hate doing that, maybe from when I was a kid at school and, you know, not achieving and a bit embarrassed. And I still thought, oh, my gosh. I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, do the right thing. And I wandered in, and obviously I've got David's expression in the control room and Chris expectantly looking at me and thinking this is just going to be horrible I know it's going to be high you know I thought just just try you know what can you do and um and I started singing the melody you know and there's Chris Neal beaming through the studio going like this and I'm going really and he goes really really and I'm going okay because you know you have this helmet on you are the backing you know, I've always been a backing vocalist in Guys and Dolls. You know, this is my job. That's what I do. I like to do everything I do very well from my ballet training, be very specific. I'm a perfectionist. And suddenly it was very different. Yeah. I mean, if, if I'm allowed to indulge for a second, I think Star You're Control. Allowed. Thank you. I think Star Control would be my, my album deep cut, but I think I would have released Love Street. I think that's the track I would have released. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that would that would have been a good single to release because he released "I Want to Hold Your Hand," didn't you? But I think I would, if it was me, I would have swapped it and released "Love Street." Yeah, I, I, a bit hazy with that. I think it was to do with yeah, I can't even remember. I think we recorded "Love Street" afterwards. I'm not sure, but um, didn't matter because you know "I Want to Hold Your Hand" was a big top ten, and who who's going to ever think about covering a Beatles track? You know, That's right? Yeah. And Chris Hill goes and he goes. Let's do this. I'm going, okay. But, you know, probably after Love's Got a Hold of Me, I would have, whatever he would have said, I would jump that high. I go, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and um, I used to think he was so knowledgeable and so experienced. And now I realize he was a guy, you know, maybe about six, seven years older than me. You know, yeah. but you kind of look at everyone that's doing something as if they know everything. But they don't. But that's how you that's how you feel. And then we get to the second album in 1980. And it's, it was more of a rocky album. Wasn't it? it had more of a rocky sound to it. And um, I, I like that. I like that. It had a rocky track to it. And I was thinking at the time that Dollar was almost sort of following the zeitgeist. You had the sort of shooting star album, which was very Star Warsy and spacey. And then you have My Sharona comes out in 79. Disco gets pushed to the side. Oh, my Sharona. Blimey, I can still even hear that kick drum and snare drum so good that's it yeah and then obviously um dollar does the paris collection now which is very rocky so i thought like was it a conscious move to move with the times or it's just purely accidental you wanted to change the sound and just aim for something a bit more harder edged uh yeah it's probably all of those just new um as i said i fell in love with pop and kind of was listening to everything and and trying to broaden my horizons and some thought if you don't move on, a bit like Guys and Dolls, we got kicked out because I kept complaining. So I thought, well, if I was complaining, you can't therefore play safe now because you've had some hit records. You've got to keep moving forward, forging forward. And um, we were just caught in the middle there. The synth revolution hadn't, well, it had with Giorgio Marone in a craft work and stuff, but it hadn't really hit the UK. So we're just in that gap. But I needed, I knew we needed to do something different and be edgier. And so we went the more slightly harder, rockier, also to get some more um, credibility by becoming a band as opposed to being a very middle of the road kind of pop act. Because that, that was it. You're either rock or you're pop. Well, the pop people, they're rubbish, you know, and you've got to be a rock act to get credibility. I mean, that's kind of, sorry, simplicity, but that's how it was. So that's really how it happened. So just trying to, and also probably personally, just going, I can be edgier in my sort of presentation, my image. You know, we can do slightly edgier things. I was listening to other, like my Sharona. I want that snare. I think that's actually fabulous. I wanted that sound. You know, I want that raspiness. I want a bit more drive, you know. Kind of, I don't want this lush, I want the lushness, but I want the drive. So interestingly, that was the conduit, wasn't it? The Paris collection from Shooting yeah. Stars through to that, which was not successful. And I've listened to that album too in the last few days. There's some cracking tracks on that album. Yeah. Yeah. The girls are out to get you. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. It's just so, and the video was so good. And I was so out of my depth even doing that and going, got to catch up catch up but such a good track you know and andy hill actually on that video he was playing bass andy right. hill was playing bass on the video so cool but um yeah and even um you take my breath away i love that like you know steel drums and it was cool it was a different groove you know and um yeah i i, I have a lot of time for that album and and it was really upsetting that we missed the mark because we were trying to transition. But then, yeah. of course, how marvellous that you go through that and then that leads, you know, you find Trevor because needs must and, you know, and that's all, it's also learning. It's a learning curve, isn't it? Yeah. Was you producing much on the second album? Did you produce much of that? Um. So, yeah, I was very much involved with Greg Walsh. I think, I think it's called Dollar and Greg Walsh, the co-production on most of it. Um, yeah, very much involved. By then I was knee deep in everything. You know, I was learning what 
you know, all the drum. I was learning everything. I mean, it's just like overload, really sensory overload all the time. Uh, and um, there are a lot of things on there that I'm very proud of, you know, that I was instrumental in doing that. And uh, we got ever so close. I mean, a couple of those singles, I mean, we're in the 50s or the 60s, you know, and that's like, basically, it's a hit in the making, but you just don't have the right. And that becomes just business, you know, yeah. business. I think you're right. I think the second album is really underrated. I think it will get its time. I really do think it will get its time. Oh, I hope, I hope so. There's a couple of tracks there that I like radio. Okay, so just just that, but radio, the backup vocals that I did, I can, I can remember absolutely how I did them, and I layered up everything. You know, there's no double tracking; it's all done by the book. Wow! And um, that's probably one of the nearest Carpenter sounds I've ever achieved. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, to it's do a, what to Wally what is that is as near as I could get it, and I was so happy with that. You know, again, a real nod to going. That's how I cut my teeth on all of this. And I worked hard and I'd, I'd do 64 layers of whatever it was per track. You know, Greg Walsh and I would be in the studio for hours. We go, do you want a break? I go, no, thanks. Let's keep going. You know, it's just. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And no one understands what you do, what it takes to get to that back in that time period. You know, you can't use machines, ADT machines. It's not the same. That the voice doesn't rub, you don't get the layering, you don't get the fullness, but it pushes it back. You know, in a, yeah, anyway, so I'm dribbling on, but it's terribly important to me, the sound, as you can possibly. Yeah, no, 100% yeah. it works. And then Trevor comes into the story, Trevor Horn at this point, to do the third album. Um, yeah. How open was he to you, like, sort of writing and producing with him as well? Not at all. <laughs> Really? <laughs> not at all no he wasn't even open to producing us but um i managed to i can be quite persuasive it's a good good um uh quality of mine and um we met him in a little um japanese restaurant which is quite forward in itself in the west end of london and um in some little back street in soho and um no no he wasn't that interested but he just said but we mentioned that we were going to later we've been asked to maybe represent the uk at the yamaha song festival tokyo right so clearly i'd had tokyo in my head for a bit because that was a you know, track on the paris collection we mentioned going to the yamaha and he thought well, are you going to japan it kind of his his light sparked his eyes sparked up behind his glasses you know and um then he said yeah he was going to go and write do a session with Bruce Woolley and he wasn't really interested he said well if anything comes up and I was quite demoralized really I thought oh. you know I was so so sure it was the right fit you know I just had this sixth sense sometimes it sounds stupid but I do and um anyway he came back he called the next day he said we've written this track do you want to come and do the vocals on the demo and that was hand held on black and white that was it wow and it's like the perfect track written for you and david isn't it it just works as a track yeah just but it was it was trial and error no i didn't realize it's trial and error for them as well it's a new thing they just tried it and um it was yeah it was just free fall and it was you know that's what's so amazing about it but i suppose the sheer belief yeah but i knew and you know what i've actually written um I won't tell you the title because that would give it away, but I have written a new song. Mm -hmm. I've written a couple actually, but I've written one song, but very specifically about that moment when I kind of, I knew. Uh, and that that's it. I mean, I mean, you know, it's not like I've got this incredible gift that someone's going to get it out of me and package it and then sell it around the world. But I knew from hearing video kill that just the bass drum, just yeah. the sound and the backup vocals. That's it for me. That was it. And I can't even understand why video killed the radio star was a hit probably about nine months beforehand or a year. And I must've heard it, but I think we were so immersed with the Paris collection that I kind of 
wasn't listening to anyone's music really i was just like very head down hmm. but after that all sort of like failed it's a good word to say failed i'll say it twice um i kind of heard this in my car thought that's it it's the clarity it's, it's just the sounds it's a separation it's the energy it's the understanding of painting a picture which is what you do with a piece of music and um yeah and uh i i knew and um trevor said i've got trevor's book which i still haven't finished because i keep reading bits over and over but he <laughs> says in one part of his book that's how he sees that's how he saw production mm. and it actually was such a um sort of an interesting thing that just he saw everything also in pictures yeah I um I've read the book and I love the book. I I got the audio book version, so Trevor's reading it, and he said a lot. He went to the pictures a lot as a child, and you kind of yes. get that cinematic songwriting idea. So he he writes like a film, but he when he talks about um yourself and David in the band, he really says it like with real love in his voice. Like he loved working with you guys. You can tell he was really sort yeah. of. I mean, he was stoned most of the time, which helps, of course. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, which he admits to. I mean, and some of the stuff he's saying. Like, what is that? Because I mean, you know, I, I think I smoked twice in my life. Once I took a, a drag, which I hated. And then actually in, you know, and another time I, I experimented with something else. I hated it even more. But I mean, yeah. he was stoned all the time. And I, but, but even in that time, I kept thinking, I want to get to whatever it was. It was still about planets. There you go. That's the theme <laughs> of our conversation. He was kind of astral traveling to that planet somewhere. And I just wanted to be, it's a bit like E.T., I just wanted to be holding his coattails, <laughs> traveling with him, but I wasn't brave enough because he had this visualization of sound that I can't tell you was just um, extraordinary as we've, we all now learn. But I sat beside his right arm the entire time I never left. Wow. Whatever he was doing, and Gary Lang and him, you know, if they were mixing or doing something really boring, I never went home. Yeah. Because you never know Quite, what you're yeah. Even sometimes in the back, you know, and Trevor doesn't even remember really, I never left because I knew, I knew that it was history. I, I, I just knew it, you know, I, and um, yeah, so we now know. I mean, people like Trevor, they're special people, aren't they? They're, they're like from somewhere else, like David Bowie. Yeah, he is, he, he is from somewhere. But such a, um, he has an extra dimension when he's working. I mean, I saw him in London and went to dinner um, when I was back in London in 2022. Hadn't seen him for a long time. And we had a lovely, and he was actually working. He said, do you want to come listen to what I'm doing? I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, come on down. You know, so got a studio in his house and um yeah but it was um exactly the same obviously we're all older but uh but it's this incredible desire to keep making and producing and and just it's just him it but it's visualization so it kind of validated all the things i kind of was thinking about when i was growing up and you know so i still when I hear music, whatever, I see pictures. I, I see the same thing. Mm. I just do. And if I see a vision like clouds, sort of like a lovely sunset or something, then I'll hear music. So my best times for writing something is when I'm walking or doing something. I certainly wouldn't want to be sitting in the studio going, write something lovely. Yeah. So, you know, people work in different ways. And some people who are, very controlled like when I did the big kiss album and I started writing those songs that was a job and I would go and sit with people in a very structured environment going well, we're going to start trying to write a song today I'm going okay you know it's um yeah it's how we roll I guess as people yeah I mean you develop your system if it works it works doesn't it um so yes. with, with Mira Mira did he just bring that in as well and just go right here's your next song was it like a production line like that? Was he just, was he writing yes. a few 
specifically or just going this song would work it, it, it was written actually um hand heaven black and white and mirror mirror were written in the same session wow if we just talk about the big kiss what was it like work with like arif mardin one of the greatest producers wow. of the time fabulous just um such a gentleman and uh it was a very it was a very weird experience walking into um after being at psalm um walking into um studios in new york atlantic studios and big big situation there and all this really incredible soul music coming out you know if, if you can hear it you know coming out of a studio and i'm thinking i'm a very very little white very english girl making this album which is meant to be this fusion us uk pop album and um it was pretty weird but i mean arif was amazing and and um the engineers and they were all gorgeous but uh i kind of tried to stop thinking about all the incredible artists he worked with because it was a bit daunting <laughs> I could imagine, yeah, you have to switch because you work with the Bee Gees and Aretha Franklin. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, you go, well, that's not me. And then very early on in the piece, he just looked at me, he goes, so what would Trevor do? <laughs> and that's what made me really understand that I kind of was maybe the secret key to Trevor. You know, and that's kind of a little bit how, and it worked the same way with Mike Chapman when I recorded um, the Gotcha um, album uh, film track. Uh, same thing. They kind of wanted to know how he did it, and they thought, well, if I've worked with him and I was there all the time, then I would know. And I kind of partially knew, but mm. I, well, who would know? I mean, only Trevor knows. No one else can do what he does. Gary Lang will be very close, I'd say, but uh, but um, yeah, but it was a it was a big question, and I just smiled at him. I said, "I'll just do what I do, and we'll mm. see where we go." Because that wasn't the you know that wasn't the deal, you know. Yeah. But that's you can understand that that it was very high end, big business with the record companies, and I just said, "Look, I'll I'll just." Do my vocals, you know. So it was a great album. Um, it is. It's great. It's very um, like I don't know if they were influenced by it, but Transvision Vamp. It's very like late uh, eighty eight. It's very sort of early that. Like I, I could imagine Wendy James singing over your backing tracks, and you would. Okay. You, yeah, it's it's. That would be I, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it just it seemed to be like a really sort of rocky, sort of punky album and it, it was it's a great album i'm going to put a spotify link to people that haven't heard it in the description for the video and oh, thank you my joe i mean i i'm so proud of the songwriting i mean that was part of my journey mm. you know can i really become a songwriter and um i was given the opportunity very great to work with the best i mean seriously the best you know and um i was offered what's love got to do with it a wow. teenage turner song and um, I went into the publishing office and I heard that. I went, that's great. I'd love to. I can hear exactly how it would be. It was kind of Trevor-esque, of course, and everything. And um, I was so excited. I went home and I was thinking, I've got a hit song there if there ever is one. And I got a call the next day. And this is before I started co-writing the album. It was, wasn't going to be all co-written. And I got a call say, I'm so sorry, but... Um, Unbeknownst to me, uh, it was sent over to Tina Turner's manager overnight, and she heard it, and she loves it so much that you can't have that. And I went, well, there's no contest, is there? So the um, the second prize was, but the writer of that song, Terry Britton, is very happy to write with you, and that's how we got to write uh, Too Much In Love, which is the, the track that we wrote. Yeah, fantastic yeah what are you up to nowadays have you got any big news to share i've got some big news um i'm going to be doing a tour fantastic um, definitely a tour in the uk this year it's not even next year or maybe but for 2023 i'm going to be doing a tour late september 
to early October. Um, only about eight or nine dates, nothing too big, but uh, dipping my toes back in. And it's more a way of going, come and say hi, you know, come and come and be part of something because it's incredibly important. As I said, I'm, am I making some new music? Maybe that's on the cards, but definitely I just want to be there in person, you know, so it's not all just social media and stuff and talking about the past. There's got to be a combination of nostalgia and current and also the future. So, you know, I could be doing this for decades, basically, <laughs> until I can't stand up anymore, which would be really funny in itself. Um, if people want to find out about the tickets to get that when it comes out, where would, where's the best place to go for that? Um, they're going to have to go onto my social media sites. You're going to ask me to tell you. You're going to have to be very clever. Put them all up on your links. Okay. Um, but it's Facebook, Twitter, and Insta. And um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a great show, and it's going to be Teresa Bazaar's dollar, Fantastic. my dollar, with a different slant on a few things and some of the really loved and sort of treasured album tracks that never got a chance to shine so that would be a really nice opportunity to kind of just perform those live you know like guessing games one of my most favorite songs ever i say please do star control and do what's love got to do with it why not <laughs> okay well all right well there you go um everyone will have to start and uh, um, probably i will say you tell me what you want me to sing and um that's a great way isn't it isn't that what you call being nice to go you tell me what you want set yeah. up a poll tell me what you want and i'll see what i can do thanks for talking to me today it's been absolutely wonderful chatting with you thank you so much for inviting me and um ask me back and i'll tell you how things are going and i can keep you informed